you'll be the one that will pray today. So let's just pray and ask God and say, Lord, speak to me. Let your word comfort with power and glory. Be merciful unto us. Grant us access into your divine mercy. Show us that which you have done. Help our heart to understand your mind. Thank him because he has heard us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, so we'll be looking at Matthew. Let's start from the book of Matthew as we consider the issue of forgiveness. We have titled it, You Are Forgiven. Or whatever title you may see, it's about forgiveness from the perspective of God. From the perspective of God. So we will start our reading by looking at Matthew chapter 27, verse 3 to 5. Matthew chapter 27, verse 3 to 5. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. We have read this particular text in order to lay a foundation for what we are discussing today and to help us to see the importance of the forgiveness of God for our lives. When you look at this passage that we just read, it looked as if everything about repentance, Judas had fulfilled it. Until the last verse I read, where it says that, and he hanged himself. So let's take a closer look at what happened. Because you will soon see that just like Judas, many Christians are suffering from guilt and condemnations. It is easier for a sinner to repent than for a Christian to repent. It is easier for you to repent when you give your life to Christ. You find it much more difficult to repent when as a Christian you have gone into sin. Guilt, shame, condemnation can be a very viable tool in the hand of Satan. So we must know where we stand with God. Now, the Bible says when Judas saw that he was condemned. Now, that means that when he saw that Jesus was condemned to death. And that suggests that Judas didn't think that anybody could kill Jesus. So he thought it was a smart move to simply make $30,000. I'm just giving an equivalent. The Bible says 30 uh, pieces of silver. So Judas thought it was um, an opportunity to make quick $30,000. And so he gave up on the location. So he gave the GPS location of Jesus. But the Bible says when he saw what happened, look at what he did. He repented himself. So far, so good. He repented himself. Is that not good? That Judas Iscariot repented. How many of you knew that? That he repented? Yes, Judas Iscariot repented. But look at the way the Bible said. He repented himself. <laughs> he repented himself, not that he repented before God. He felt bad for what he has done. That's what it means. He felt bad. 
Then look at the next step he did. And brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Is that not another wonderful step? He returned what he had gotten uh, wrongly. He returned what he had gotten wrongly. We are looking at Matthew chapter 27, verse 3 to 5. So you will think that this is wonderful. So far, so good. Then when you go to verse 4, he said, I have sinned. He acknowledged his sin. He confessed his sin. This looked like a thorough repentance. He said, I have sinned. I have betrayed the innocent blood. Of course, they didn't care. They said, what is that to us? And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed. So he returned the money. So look at the process. He felt sorry. He felt bad. He returned the money. He confessed that he had sinned. Is that not fantastic? Is that not what, is, what God expects of us to do? But there is a little problem. The last sentence says, and went, he said, and departed and went and hanged himself. That's the problem. Judas did not receive the forgiveness of God. The fact that you felt bad is not forgiveness. <laughs> the fact that you confess your sin does not mean that you have received forgiveness of God. The fact that you return what was stolen or you try to amend what you had done wrong. does not mean that you understand forgiveness. You see, self-righteousness can disguise itself as repentance. Do you know that the fact that you felt, ah, this is bad, just, that's not, that does not mean you have received the forgiveness of God. So Judas felt bad. Judas felt condemned. And the only thing he could now think of was to take his own life. He didn't repent. He didn't want shame. He didn't want all of those things. He could not accept the forgiveness of God. Many people today are suffering exactly like Judas. You are depressed. You are condemned. You are ashamed. And I'm talking about people in the church. I'm talking about believers. Guilt has eaten deep into your soul. You know within yourself that this is bad. But the problem is that even you cannot bring yourself to ask God to forgive you. You know there are things you do. You start doubting whether God can forgive you. The problem is that you are doing something that I don't know how we can rectify it. You see, you are thinking, you think of God as of yourself. And sincerely, how else will you think of God? You've never been God before and you'll never be God. God is not like us. You felt that I know that this thing was sinful. I still went ahead and did it. So you felt you don't deserve forgiveness. And Satan will capitalize it and trouble you and trouble you. When you need them to pray, Satan will remind you. And you know, sometimes in our heart, we have scale for sin. So you are saying to yourself, I know God will forgive me for lying. But abortion, oh, no, 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 no. Ah, 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 I killed a baby. I killed a baby. It could become so bad when you sleep, you'll be seeing baby in your dreams. <laughs> so you believe God is tormenting you. 
Say, ah, I slept with a married man. Oh God. Ah, yee, can I be forgiving? And so you have allowed guilt to hold you captive. God will never. You see, there's one thing God does not tolerate with his children. Guilt. Because guilt will hold you bound. You can't make progress with God with guilt. That's why God will always deal with your gift, your guilt. He will first of all deal with the issue of forgiveness. Did you notice that those people that Jesus healed, that had issue with sin, do you know what he did was first to tell them, you are forgiven. Do you know that what he said? Your sins are forgiven. That announcement is a pattern. You see, sometimes when you read it, you just think that Jesus just said you are forgiven. See, that person hearing it from the master, that he is forgiven, you don't know what that does to the soul. Do you know that sometimes what you need is a reassuring that you are truly forgiven? So I have read this passage to show you how dangerous guilt can be. You, be, you can become depressed. Do you know you may lose appetite for food because sin, there's, there's something, guilt of a sin is troubling your heart. So you, you don't even have appetite to eat. And can I tell you something? If you don't deal with guilt, you can carry it for 100 years. It won't go. <laughs> if you don't know the solution to guilt, to condemnation, it will, time does not heal guilt because guilt is not just about you. The accuser of the brethren is involved. That's why time doesn't heal it. So even though, even though you, you, you raped a girl 15 years ago, Satan will always tell you that you, <laughs> you mean, you mean, you, you, you mean, you want to go far with God. Did you remember that terrible thing you did 15 years ago? So time does not heal guilt. Time does not heal condemnation. It will continue to trouble you. And a guilty or troubled conscience cannot pray effectively, cannot read the Bible effectively, and cannot hear the spirit of the Lord in your inner man. You are basically stranded. You are basically on one spot. Guilt can eat deep into people's soul. You can grow lean because of guilt. You will grow lean. You, guilt will make you feel that you do not deserve God. You don't, guilt will make you feel you don't deserve mercy. Guilt will magnify your sin and make your sin look like it's greater than every other person's sin. Did you know Peter betrayed Jesus three times? Essentially, all the disciples of Jesus betrayed him. Essentially. But they all came back. Imagine how Peter felt when he deliberately denied Jesus. Willfully. He went and sinned deliberately. Yet, Jesus said, send for Peter's. He was forgiven. He was cleansed. He still became an apostle. You see what Satan will have said to Peter is you, you. How can you be an apostle of God? How can God use you? How can God give you the key of the kingdom? You, Peter. Ordinary small girl, you are telling lies. But he still became an apostle. That is how rich. The Bible says God who is rich in mercy. No, this generation is looking for a God that is rich in money. But he says, God, who is rich in mercy? Ah! I don't know how else to say that. 
He is not like us. God is not man. He is not man. His ways and his thoughts, they far exceed ours. Unfortunately, we still think of him as we think of ourselves. So let's see what God has done about our sin. How does God forgive sin? That terrible sin that you think that of all sin, this one, God cannot forgive you this one. <laughs> let's look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Verse, um, verse 12, I think. <clears throat> 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. Can I read something to you? I pray that you will hear God as I read the scripture to you. He says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Did you hear what I'm saying today also? I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. God is saying to some of you as you are hearing me now. That that sin, he has forgiven it. Do you know that God doesn't say I'm going to forgive you? <laughs> God always talks about forgiveness in past participle. He says... Because your sins are forgiving. Are forgiving. He didn't say, I am going to forgive you. They are for that sin that you are condemning yourself for. He said he has forgiven you. Why did he forgive you? It's not because you cry. <laughs> I know some of you love to cry. It's not because you roll on the ground. It's not because you repented. Thank God for your repentance. He says, you are forgiving for his name's sake. Brethren, you need to understand why God forgives. You see, there must be a reason for forgiveness. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. There was a reason. He said, the reason I'm, I forgive him is for my name's sake. Because of my name. Thank God that God does not forgive us because of him, because of us. Hey! None of us will be forgiven. He doesn't forgive us because of ourselves. He said, he, I forgive you for my name's sake. Do you know what the Bible says? It says, just as God, for Christ's sake, forgave our sins. It was because of Jesus that God forgives the strength of the forgiveness of God is based on Jesus. It's not based on you. The capacity and elasticity of God to forgive is not based on us. It is based on Jesus. For his name's sake. It's not because you are good. It's not because you are better than others. It's not because you know how to repent more than others. It is for his name's sake. Every one of us, we are forgiven for his name's sake. And I'm so glad that it's not for my sake. It is for his own name's sake. Do you know what that means? If he looks at me, he won't be able to forgive me. So he looks at his name. He looks at Jesus. By the time God looks at Jesus and looks back, <laughs> he can't see anything again. He has forgiven for Jesus' sake. On account of Jesus. Thank God it is on account of Jesus. It is not on your account. It is on account of Jesus. So this is where I'm going to put it now. I speak to you. Little children. Because your sins, plural. Your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Did you know that John was just writing? Did John know whether they confessed their sins? 
Did John know whether they repented of their sins? And yet he was so sure to write them and assure them that they have been forgiven. I'm saying to you, you have been forgiven. That sin that has made you restless. Because of Jesus, God had forgiven you. That sin that you are thinking that this one is too big, this one, ah, 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 this one is too big. He said he has forgiven you for his name's sake. You see, some of you, what you are going to experience now is going to be real. What I'm going to say now, you are going to experience it. You are going to feel light. Heaviness is going to lift you. You, you will see, you will, you will feel heaviness leave your spirit. Because the blood of Jesus is doing a work as I speak. You will see heaviness. It's just going, just flying away. You are just becoming light. You may have been sad. You will have joy. For the, for the spirit of heaviness, the garment of praise is coming on you. Even now. Let me show you further what the Lord has done for us. Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. Verse 13. Sorry, Colossians 2, 13 and 14. Let me read it. It says, And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, had he quickened together with him. Now look at the look at the tense of the for, of the word forgive again. Had he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. How many? All trespasses. Having forgiven. It's like God just announced forgiveness. Do you know what, what happened to David when he sinned? He lost the joy of his salvation. Some of you have lost it. He's coming back now. The day he said, God, I have sinned. Do you know what God said? He said, I have forgiven you. God didn't say, I'm going to forgive you. He said, I've forgiven you. He said, he had forgiven you all. All trespasses. You see, when they say trespass, it's like when you set a boundary and you say nobody goes beyond this and somebody goes beyond it. Now, the boundary that God has set is his word. But you have gone, you have gone there. You have gone there. You are a married man. Or you are not a married man. You are sleeping with a married woman. You know what you have done? You have trespassed. You have gone, you have entered into a boundary that you ought not to enter into. It's a trespass. When you violate the word of God, you trespass. He's, in, he's himself saying this to us. Also. He says, having forgiven you all trespasses, not some. Not some small, small, small ones. And then he left the big, big, big ones. And, and, and we are saying this with all sense of responsibility and seriousness. Not because forgiveness is easy. You will soon see why it is not easy, but it is given freely. God says he has forgiven you all your trespasses. Look at verse 14. Plotting out the handwriting of the ordinances that were against us, which was contrary to us, and he took it away, nailing it to the cross. So in case the devil has some form of um, written offenses against you and he's holding it and he's saying, pastor, you, you a pastor, you a pastor. Remember that girl that came to your office. Remember that girl. That was how you were slipping your hand into a skirt. A pastor, a pastor. Look at what you, look. how can you pray? 
and now you want to pray how can you pray look at it i have the date here in case satan wants to do that he said plotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us took it out of the way nailing it to the cross and at the cross everything ends everything ends at the cross that's why cross is dead it is because death could not hold Jesus that resurrection happened. And only Jesus resurrected. All our sin that he took to the cross didn't resurrect. So everything was terminated at the cross. Can we look more? Let's look at Ephesians 1.7. Ephesians 1 7. It says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. There is a, there is, there is, there is an importance to forgive sin. You see, Let me just summarize human nature to you this way. By nature, we are sinners. By nature, we are sinners. As a sinner, we produce sins. Because we produce sin, we offend God. So, God had to take care of all those three problems. Starting first with our sinful nature. So, what did he do? He took that to the cross. He nailed it there. What about the sin that we produced? So, they pierced Jesus and his blood came out. And that blood is sufficient. Oh, God, what a blood. A drop of the blood of Jesus is sufficient to wash clean every human being that had ever lived in history if they will place their faith in jesus what about offense because when you sin that's why when you sin you don't feel free to pray or go to god you know why you sense an offense towards god that was what abraham um, adam sensed when god called to him he could not approach God because he had offended God. Have you noticed that? Okay, maybe some none of you here has done that. If you had ever committed adultery without your spouse knowing, when you see your spouse, when you get back home, there is a feeling you feel. You don't feel free because you have offended your spouse. Your own conscience will sense it. So, God now needed Jesus to be a reason for him to forgive us. So he has to take care of our sinful nature. He has to take care of the sins we produce. He has to also take care of the offense towards him. Forgive, that word forgive means it is God forgiving. God must forgive. But the only reason God would forgive is Jesus. We are not qualified to be forgiven of our own. So God will not, if God wants to keep looking at us to forgive us, we will just perish one day. So what he did was that, okay, I won't look at you. I'll look at Jesus. And on account of Jesus, my son, I'll forgive you. That means he's forgiving us for his name's sake. For his name's sake. First John 1 9. Let's look at more issues around this. First John 1 9. Look at what it says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. You understand that? 
You see, we don't understand what that statement means because we are not faithful and just. <laughs> we are not faithful to our words. God is faithful to his own words. If you confess, he says, I will forgive you. He will. He's faithful. He's not going to say, well, the last time you were playing smart, you think I didn't see you. <laughs> if you were a human being, that's what you would do. You say, well, I can't forgive you because you were trying to outsmart me and I saw you. <laughs> that is a God is faithful and just. To forgive our sins. Plural. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So do you see that he goes beyond what we, what we confess? He will even look at other areas that you don't know now. You don't even see it. That's why there is a continuous washing of the blood of Jesus upon our lives. Those, those sins that has come to your conscience is because you know those sins. Do you know how many sins you don't even know? You are not even aware that what you are doing is sinful. You are walking in the flesh. You don't even know you are walking in the flesh. The Bible says he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That is his work. None of us can do that for ourselves. He cleanses you from all unrighteousness. Oh, what a precious, how precious the blood of Jesus. That he washes our sins away. That's why our conscience is free. That's why we can approach God. You know, it's because you are, you are living a sin-conscious life. That is why when you want to pray, your, your pattern is, Father, we thank you, we bless your name, we give you all the glory, thank you for today, thank you for everything, for food. Now, Lord, we want to come before you and confess our sins. You know why? You do not have the boldness to just approach the presence of the Lord without having confessed your sin. It's because you do not understand how God deals with sin. That prayer pattern is not correct. At any point in time, you should be able to burst forth in the presence of God. You just feel you are walking... You are working on the system. You just feel like praying. Just begin to pray. Father, glory be to your name in the highest. I honor you. Thank you, Father. Because we dwell in his presence. It's not as if we went out of his presence and then we are coming back. So we have to confess all our sins. There is a continuous washing that is going on. And God does. You see, guilt is, is painful to God. You know why? Because it keeps us away from him. And yet he has taken care of it. But if you don't know, Satan will keep using that condemnation to keep you away from God, to keep you from your father. Do you think it is because we have lived right that we have access to the presence of God? It is the blood of Jesus. And you can, no, Christians can, no Christian can outgrow the blood of Jesus. We will always approach God on the basis of his blood. It's not on the basis of our work. Forget this impression that some ministers create for you to give you an impression that they have access to God that you don't have. It is a lie. It is the blood of Jesus that gives me access to the throne of God. It is that same blood that gives you access. Nobody can access the throne of God outside of the blood of Jesus. It is the blood. So we can approach him anytime we can burst forth in praise. That's why when you are filled with the Holy Ghost, you will just be bursting in praise. You will just be bursting in prayers. I'm telling you, the life of a Christian is a praying life. You do not necessarily, I do not mean that you verbalize those prayers 24 hours. But since heart is continuously praying to God. Because you dwell in his presence. You are not, all this uh, when we gather together and say, uh, let's invite the Holy Ghost. Stop inviting the Holy Ghost. The Bible said your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Where are you inviting him from? From where should he come from? How can you be inviting somebody you carry inside of you? <laughs> you carry somebody inside of you. And then we get to a meeting. You say, let's invite the Holy Ghost. From where? Is it for him to jump out from inside of us to come and do what? Or what? Say, where two of you are gathered in my name, I'm there. By faith, we know he's there. It's not by invitation. It is by faith. 
No, we do so many religious stuff. We don't even give thought to many of these things. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. He dwells in you. When we gather, we, we bring his presence together. Stop inviting him. Just believe he's with you. They said, now let's approach his presence. We are not approaching his presence. We are dwelling in his presence. How can The Holy Ghost is already in us. That's to tell you we dwell in the presence of God. That's why Jesus said that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. It has nothing to do with location, posture, or whatsoever. We worship God only in spirit and in truth. It's 24 hours. Because you dwell in his presence. Just like the cherubim. The cherubim, the seraphim, the angels, the 24 elders, innumerable creatures in heaven. It's 24-7. There's no time that they take a break and say, they go toilet break and say, okay, let's take a toilet break. Um, let's go and eat. Let's go and eat. Um, um, let's go and do some. No, 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 no. Do you know it's 24 hours? For eternity. The Bible said they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's what God has replicated in us. That's why the Holy Ghost is in us. That's why I say singing and making melody in your heart. Oh, one day God will help us to look at Christian songs. <laughs> the, the real place of singing in the new creation life. What we are doing in most cases is still not the, it's not the singing of the new creation life. The singing of the new creation life is powerful. It's not, it has nothing to do with instruments. It says making melody in your heart unto the Lord. God is your audience in the new creation. And then we sing to one another for edification. But our singing primarily is unto God. That's why you must be careful as a music minister that your desire is to be before crowd. If in your closet you are not happy that God is your audience, why do you want to be in the presence of men? What do you think men will give you? I would rather sing before God where nobody will see me than to sing before a million crowd. God as an audience is greater than the entire human race. Making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Ephesians, Ephesians 5. Let me read a common passage, Hebrews 8, 12. And then I will look at the seriousness of forgiveness and we'll close. Hebrews 8, 12 is just to remind us, I'm sure we know it. He said, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins, plural, and their iniquities, plural. I will remember no more. It is Satan that remembers your sin. It's not God. It is the devil that keeps a record of your sin. It is not God. God said, I will remember no more. And if God will not remember something, you better do well to forget it. And sometimes it's your self-righteousness. You can't bring to bear yourself that, oh, how can I have done such a terrible thing? How can I have done such a dirty thing? My friend, my brothers and sisters, it's not that thing that makes you useless. The sinful nature has made all of us useless. It was Jesus who came and gave us a new life. So stop feeling like, who am I? Look at me. Look at what I have done. Look at how, how low I have descended. <laughs> a sinner is already on the ground. In fact, the Bible says you that you were dead in your trespasses. You are talking of how low, how low I have gone. How low. Look at such a dirty thing. Dirty thing. How could I have bring myself to practice homosexuality? I was even doing threesome. I was doing foursome. And so what? So it's greater than the blood of Jesus. You know what sin does is that sin makes itself look bigger than the blood of Jesus. Yet the blood of Jesus, as in one drop, is sufficient for all of 
all of the sins of humanity. So you can see how powerful the blood of Jesus is. That one blood, one a drop of the blood of Jesus is sufficient to wash away the sins of all humanity from the creation of man till the end of man. So don't let sin make itself look bigger than the forgiveness of God. Sin is not bigger than the forgiveness of God. And God is not man. It's not man. When David sinned, did God take it lightly? No. The child that came from that adultery didn't survive. But look at the mercy of God. The same God gave Solomon to David through Bathsheba, the woman he sinned with. Not through the legal wives. Through Bathsheba. And God named Solomon the beloved of God. And God says Solomon will succeed David. That's how God forgives. And why do you think do you think David will see all of that and have a doubt that God has forgiven him? May you see the goodness of God. May you see enough proof that He has forgiven you because I don't know what proof you are looking for. But look at God. If it was you, is it Bathsheba that will give back to Solomon? That is the mercy of God. So he said, I will remember them no more. God doesn't lie. He doesn't flatter with words. Now, let's conclude. You see, because we have spoken this way, it's not because um, we are trivializing sin. No. It's not because we feel that, you know, there's no big deal about sin. No. Sin is a real issue. But the reason why we can obtain this forgiveness is because somebody paid a price for it. That's why I want to read to you Isaiah 53. Again, a passage that you know. Isaiah 53. Let me start reading from verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with griefs. Can you imagine if somebody says you are acquainted with griefs? You know, if I say that I am very acquainted with this brother, I'm trying to say I know him very well. So when the scripture says he's acquainted with grief, that's what Jesus was acquainted with, grief. A man of sorrows, that sorrow is in plural. Jesus experienced sorrow to the point he was being described as a man of sorrow. I'm showing you that somebody paid a price for this forgiveness that we are receiving. We heed, he said, acquainted with grief, and we heed as it were our faces from him. He was despised and esteemed him not, and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs. So those grief that Jesus was acquainted with were your griefs. Did you know that Jesus had taken your griefs? And carried our sorrow. Hallelujah. He carried our sorrows. Plural. He, he had borne our griefs. Plural. Yet, yet we did esteem him stricken. Smitten of God and afflicted. Smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. With his stripes, we are healed. Why did God say, I have forgiven you? Because of Jesus. 
the cruel death that Jesus suffered on the cross is to show us God's grievance towards sin. So brethren, truly you have been forgiven. Don't take it for granted. Truly he has cleansed you. Don't take it for granted. That sin that has been troubling you, God has taken that guilt. God has taken it today. But don't take it for granted. You didn't do anything. You just said, Father, I'm sorry. And he says, I've forgiven you. It's because somebody paid the price. Huh? <laughs> somebody paid the price. You know, we give our books for free. And we write on them not to be sold. And we send it to different states and different countries. And people get copies for free. <laughs> and many have read it. And we have had remarkable testimonies. Can I tell you? A lady sent her entire one month salary. Says, use it for this book. I'm not asking you to go and send your entire month salary. Just illustrating something to you. Many people that, the, those who read the books, or who are reading the books, or who will read the books, will never know. They made sacrifice and paid the price. The lady who sent her entire one month wage, she said, I didn't know how I was going to survive the, for one month. But I just felt this is God. And God kept her for one, that one month. And God has been keeping her. But for every other person, what they saw was a beautiful book in their hand. Ah, thank you so much. You mean you gave us this for free? Yes, it's for free. Some people pay the price. The printer that printed it, the publisher, is also a believer. He didn't do it like a job. He also did it as a ministry, as a service. Some people, sometimes he, he, he will bring those books late at night because we have a deadline to send it to somewhere. Around time like this, he will bring it. Somebody paid the price. But for the recipient on the other end, it was free. Hallelujah. Oh, God, we thank God. Oh, we thank God. Pick your copy, it's free. Three of the books are, are now available for free. By God's grace, every other book will be available for free. But every time I say, oh, it's free. Everything is free, free, free. Our marriage course is free. Both for singles, for married, is free. Just log in and go online. You take the course, it's free. But I tell you, on, the, on our end here, it's not free. A brother designed that website for us for free. And we are paying in dollars. For all the things that are being used to run that site like that. On this end. But the other end is free. Brethren, Jesus paid a heavy price that is beyond all this one I'm talking about. So that we can receive forgiveness for free. The reason why I have to mention this is so that you do not take it for granted. The fact that it is free didn't mean a price was not paid. The fact that you could go to God and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and you are forgiving is because somebody someday took nails in his hands, took 39 lashes, had bruises on his head, took a spear. 
to his heart, nails to his legs, shame and disgrace publicly, to die a cruel death. Before they could even break the legs of Jesus, he had died. He had suffered so much. He died very quickly. And fulfilled prophecy, they didn't have to break his bones. That is our Savior. He had the power to stop everything they did to him. He chose to suffer and die. Do you know you and I, we don't choose to suffer. We actually don't have power to stop our suffering. <laughs> Jesus had power to stop his own suffering. But he suffered. Don't take it for granted. Appreciate him. But at the same time, you must also not lose sight of the fact that it is free. And he said, he has forgiven you. He has cleansed you. He has washed you. Have the boldness now to go into the presence of the Lord. Have the boldness now to pray. Have the boldness to sing to the Lord. Have the boldness to read the scripture. Have the boldness, you know, to rebuke Satan, to rebuke demons. Because when you see activity of demon and you want to rebook it, Satan will quickly tell you, hey, you are a sinner, hey, 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 hey. And then you become afraid, guilt, and then you feel timid. Now go and rebuke it. When Peter asked the man that was lame to walk, and that man rose up and walked, do you know what he said? He said, why do you look at us as if by our holiness we have made this man to walk? But by the name of Jesus. Don't let anything hold you down again. Don't let guilt and condemnation hold you down again. Go in the presence of the Father. Enjoy his presence. Enjoy his presence once again. Know that you are forgiven. Know that your basis for approaching God is not because you lived right. It is because of the blood of Jesus. And it is the blood that will make us to live right. It is in his presence we can live right. So don't let anything keep you away from the presence of God. Even if you have sinned, the only place where it can be restified is if you come to God. So where are you running to? Your depression is a sign of pride. It's, a, it's pride. You feel that what you have done is too much for the forgiveness of God. There is nothing too much for the forgiveness of God. You are even judging, you are rating sin by your own head. Do you know the sin that God despised the most? The Herod that killed children two years and below. Nothing happened to him. The Herod that was just talking. He was just talking. And then some people say his voice sounded like the voice of God. The Bible says he didn't give glory to God. And worm ate him alive while he was still speaking. So you, which one of them has done a greater sin? He was just speaking. He, he's not saying he is God. He was just speaking. It was people who said he sounded like God. So stop, stop judging, stop rating your sin and say, ah, this is dirty. How can I have done this? You are, you are dirty too. That's why the blood of Jesus has washed you. That's why his blood washes us. It, it says it cleanses us from all unrighteousness. The word cleanse means it was dirty. Yes, I agree. What you did was dirty. But the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all unrighteousness. It makes you clean. Believe it, accept it, and walk in that reality. The Bible said the righteous are as bold as lion. There is a boldness that comes to you knowing your life is right with God. And it is Jesus that has made your life right with God. Because God has forgiven you on account of Jesus. Don't be timid anymore. Be bold. Yet, be grateful. Let us pray. Let us pray. Just give him all the glory. Thank him for forgiving you. You have, you have maybe this sin has hindered you for a long time. You have been troubled. You, you feel bad. You feel dirty. But you are hearing it now. God is saying it to you. I have forgiven you. I have forgiven you. I knew you were stupid. But I have forgiven you. God is lifting heavy hearts today. So give him the glory. Give him the honor. Say, Father, thank you. 
Father, thank you. I can come to your presence. Do you know how God said we should come? He said, therefore, let us go to the throne of God. Let us come boldly. Boldly. How can you come boldly? It's because he has forgiven us. Sin can never allow you to approach God boldly. You will feel inadequate. You will feel you are not good enough. But God is saying to you today, you are good enough because of me, not because of yourself. Because of the blood of my son, you are good enough. Because for my name's sake, I have forgiven you. You are good enough. Come boldly to my presence. Come and speak to me boldly. Stop feeling that you are not good enough. Stop feeling you need another man to help you to approach God. You are good. The Father is saying to you today, come to me boldly. Not rudely, but boldly. God doesn't want us to be timid. He wants us to be confident in his blood. None of us can make ourselves righteous. Our righteousness is of Christ. And therefore we are bold. Therefore we have confidence in God. Approach him boldly today. Let your heart open to the Holy Ghost. Oh, embrace the presence of the Lord. Don't be afraid like Adam. You have been hiding. You've been hiding. Today God is breaking those leaves behind which you are hiding. He said, come to me. You are not a sinner. I have washed you. Come to me. Come to me. Come boldly. Come bo I am not saying what you said you did. Something God said he will not remember. You are saying God is counting it against you. He said, your sin and iniquity, I will remember no more. If you ask God now, sir, this, this lady that is depressed because she's feeling guilty, what did she do? God said, I don't know what she did. I can't see anything she did. Because he can't remember. He said, I will remember no more. He said, I will remember no more. And you are depressed. For what God said, he will remember no more. Stop feeling dirty. Stop feeling you are not good enough. No matter what you think you have done. So give him all the glory. Thank Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are the one that made all this possible. You are the one that made all this available. We don't have to be sacrificing animal every day. Because of you, Jesus, we are grateful. You bore our sin on the cross. You paid the price. It came to us free, but it was pain, agony, and stress for you. Even your sweat became as blood. But for us, it was easy. For us, we are just rejoicing. Because you forgave us. It came to us free. Father, it came to us free. But for you, Jesus, you paid the price. We say thank you, Jesus. Thank you for, the, for paying our price. Thank you for paying my price. Thank you for including my own price on the price you paid on that day. Thank you, Jesus. I enjoy it for free. But you paid the price. What an awesome Savior we have. What a glorious God that we have. That he made it free because he paid the price himself. Thank him and give him all the glory. Just, let's just give him the glory today. Just sing to him and enjoy his presence. That presence that has been denied you by the accuser of the brethren. Today, God is silencing the mouth of the accuser in your life. He has been accusing you of that sin 12 years ago. He has been accusing you of what you did six months ago. He has been accusing you of something that took place 30 years ago. Today, God is silencing his mouth. He's silencing his mouth. He said, I've forgiven my children. I've forgiven them. They can come boldly to me. I do not remember what they have done. This blood of my son has washed them clean. Come boldly to me. Don't be intimidated. Don't be afraid. Come boldly to him. Enjoy him. He's your father. Enjoy him. You are good enough for him. Men may think you are not good enough for them. But as far as God is concerned, you are good enough for him to pay a price for you. Can you imagine? God paid a price for you. Why? Because you are good enough. Oh, just like Potiphar. He paid a price for Joseph. He paid a price when he saw Joseph. God has paid a price for you. He has paid a price for you. You can come boldly to his presence. Let nothing hold you down again. 
Let those chains of guilt and condemnation be broken away from your life. Thank you, Jesus. Let's round up our praise. It's really praise today, Father. It's really praise. What an awesome Savior. Who am I to stand in the presence of God if not for the blood of Jesus? If not for your namesake, Father, that you forgive me. You forgave me my sins. You forgave me all my sins. You plotted out my sins. Thank you, Father. Give him all the glory. Give him all the praise. Let's so round up our praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we have praised the name of the Lord. Amen.